Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's quarterly webinar. As a reminder, due to the high number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute during the presentations. If you have questions, please submit them to the moderator in the Q&A box located on your control screen. Presenters will answer questions during our panel discussion. Before we get started today, I want to take a moment and recognize all of our great sponsors and special thanks to the members of the Mac Baldrige Society who serve as trustees for the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence and our newest Mac Baldrige Society member about healthcare. Today's topic is a presentation from About Healthcare, connecting those in need with those who heal faster. About is a solutions company that empowers hospitals and health systems to operate as one connected network of care, enabling easy access for clinicians to move patients into and out of the acute care setting and getting them to the next best care setting faster and easier. Complemented by clinical experts and best practices, ABOUT provides health systems the necessary controls and insights to grow with resilience, drive clinician effectiveness, and improve patient outcomes. Here's today's agenda and featured guests. Our guest presenters are Angie Franks, the CEO from ABOUT Healthcare, and Ben Sawyer, Vice President of Marketing and Development from ABOUT Healthcare. They will be followed by questions from the moderator and then brief updates from the Baldrige Performance Excellence Program, the Alliance for Performance Excellence, and Communities of Excellence. And now I will turn it over to Angie and Ben to get us started. Great, thanks so much, Al, and uh, such a pleasure to not only be here with all of you today, but to be a sponsor uh, for the Mac Baldridge uh, Foundation. It is, uh, it is just a privilege to be associated with such an, or an organization that represents um, everything uh, about excellence. And we're really going to talk about that today here in today's webinar. Um, we're going to give you an overview of what ABOUT is all about and how we work with hospitals and health systems to operate more effectively as one system of care. And it's just a timely um, topic for all of us today, um, all of us that are passionate about the healthcare industry and how we can continue to improve the way we operate um, to make it more effective and efficient for our staff, physicians, nurses, case managers, um, but most appropriately and importantly, to make sure that we've got the patient at the center of everything we do and we're making decisions that are appropriate for, uh, for the patient and their best clinical outcome. Um, as we talk about our company today and introduce you to, to about healthcare, we're going to do so through the lens of data. We're a very market-driven organization and work with others in the industry to um, ensure that we are staying focused and addressing um, issues of interest and solving problems that are most relevant to, uh, to health systems operating as a system of care. And the pandemic really began to um, really showcased and highlighted where we have weaknesses and fissures in our in our healthcare um, operating environment, especially as it relates to organizational silos. And those silos can exist within a health system, and they can exist um, between um, health systems and and. We saw both of those play out in magnificent uh, fashion um, as the stress of demand through the pan COVID pandemic um, highlighted those uh, organizational silos. So about empowers hospitals and health systems to operate as one connected network of care. We do so by providing the controls and insights for health systems to move patients into their health system. So more uh, on the patient acquisition front um, and more moving patients in um, into the acute setting of care. And then as patients are um, getting ready to exit the acute setting and move to the next best setting of care, um, handling that process and that care transition to the next um, best setting or optimal setting of care, um, we connect. And so we're gonna take you through how we do that, um, why that matters, um, what's so important about it from the lens of the operations for the health system as well as the patient, and what that can be um, translated to in terms of outcomes 
and impact and results for your health system. We're going to leverage some data through today's um, presentation, and you can uh, see the, uh, the pie chart here on the left side of the screen is a survey that we recently completed with the Health Management Academy, a broad cross-section of uh, hospital system leaders who provided input and insight um, to their key challenges. And you'll see that overwhelmingly their number one and two challenges um, that they identified were the workforce issues that all of us are facing today. And number two, operating as one or driving more systemness. So we're going to explore um, about healthcare through the lens of those two key challenges today. So thanks, Angie, for that, TF. Uh, this is Ben Sawyer. Nice to be with all of you today. Um, interestingly enough, we did a webinar through the Leader Dialogue Program that we're doing in collaboration with the Baldrige Foundation on Tuesday titled Burnout. And you can find that on the, the Leader Dialogue site or any of the podcast sites that you like using, whether it's Google, uh, Apple, et cetera. Um, so just to take right off on what Angie talked about. Why is this important right now? Well, obviously staffing is in flux. Uh, people are stressed by poor operational systems and processes. There's been a lot of attrition of clinical staff. Uh, some refer to it as the great exodus. That's actually a title of a article written in Inc. Magazine recently. And so there's just a lot of disruption and change as all of you know on, on this call. Next slide. So let's just talk about how the process works. Based on what Angie teed up with you, I, I wanna just give you examples kind of in the acute care space. Um, we could talk more about PAC in another setting, but essentially uh, the first part is confronting the disconnects, essentially what are the opportunities for improvement, right? What are the OFIs for inefficient transfers? Right now that's resulting in many health systems in patient leakage, which is not something they can afford and the manual processes and fragmented reporting stress staff. Um, if you could hit the next button there, Jerry. So the optimal flow consideration to help de-stress the staff and achieve the organizational objectives is to invest in deploying a seamless access and orchestration hub and integrate functions such as on-call provider coordination and computer-aided dispatch or CAD of your uh, transport vendors. So essentially what you're doing is taking what often is very manual and automating those best practices with technology so that it's seamless and efficient and supports the key staff in terms of those front end functions. If you can hit the button there. Yep, thanks, Jerry. So the, the next one is highly variable discharge planning. We're all familiar with that, right? That adds to excess days in the length, length of stay. And there's a, an undue reliance on staff for the estimated date of discharge or EDD uh, determination, as well as the patient disposition information during the multidisciplinary rounds, which perpetuates patient progression delays. So again, a way to use technology such as ours to help with that is to start by initiating discharge planning right at admission and using that estimated date of discharge and disp disposition intelligence to drive that daily multidisciplinary rounding planning and action. The next item is, you know, it's, it can be very tedious to manage and just resolve the barriers in that length of stay process. That alone stresses the workforce uh, a lot. So there's, there's too many open orders to track. They need to text and call to prioritize. So an example of using uh, intelligent technology here to help with that is to be able to prioritize the barriers and orchestrate the effort with the ancillaries, for example, to resolve those obstacles and to explore things like artificial intelligence and machine learning opportunities to identify rate limiting steps and prompt the next best steps in the patient's care journey. And the, the final one is just a quick reference to post-acute access and transport impediments Often there's chaos at the end of the acute stay, right? It's like, where exactly is that patient going to go? We know they need a sniff or we know they need an LTAC or whatever, but, but specifically where? 
And so there's a process that overloads the care team and resources. So the, the notion here is using a curated network and automated technology to ensure that the PAC provider options are clear and available to schedule early in the stay. For example, if they're there, the patient's gonna be there for four days, you're, you're getting this started on day one and day two and essentially eliminating that, that back end stress and finding effective tools to manage uh, pack reservations and transport. Jerry, if you can hit the next button. So again, the way the process works is to decompress the staff and drive sustainable results by essentially overcoming the kinds of challenges that the staff face every day and are more acute in this, in this COVID environment. The final point I would make is that what the approach here is really to augment the electronic medical record. It's, it's a enhancer using composable solutions to effectively address performance gaps and maximize measurable results. Again, uh, underscoring what Angie had said earlier, which is there's already been a lot of investments in technology, but the question is, is it making the logistical impact necessary to uh, create efficient and effective care transitions? All right, Jerry, if you can go to the next slide. So let's just talk a little bit about what results can be expected with this. And Angie, jump in here, whatever, you, whatever you'd like. Sure. So what we did is we just mapped it to five common health system ROI priorities that I think all of you can relate to. And the, the goal, again, is to enable health systems to leverage a real-time health system uh, platform to achieve friction-free experience for patients and providers. Gartner has been talking a lot about this uh, lately, and it seems to be the next uh, evolution of healthcare operations. So let's start from left to right. So the, the very first step is gaining one call access. So it's, it's not unusual when uh, health systems are receiving a transfer in for it to take up to six hours, sometimes more, to get the patient in. What we've been able to, to demonstrate with many, many health systems, most of the major health systems in the United States and about 800 hospitals, is the ability to get a patient in within 15 to 30 minutes. That's really quick, as you can appreciate. And the reason is everything is streamlined. Everything from the call, the on-call provider group is already uh, ready and waiting. Uh, the computer-aided dispatch for transport coordinates with the uh, emergency transport to get the patient to the right facility. And we did a study with the University of Utah Medical Center to try to ascertain what kind of a financial impact would that be. And the, the average is about $10,800 in average contribution margin. So, so these, are, these are big impacts for uh, organizations. The back end of that number one process is being able to leverage then the estimated date of discharge in the daily multidisciplinary rounding dispositions to get the discharge underway early so that as you move into number two, which is the clinical progression of care to a timely and effective discharge, you're already ahead of the game. And the multidisciplinary round then is identifying obstacles to care, anticipating those and planning for them and dealing with them, including the PAC, uh, the post-acute care uh, assignments with that curated network. The opportunity there is if you can uh, successfully in a high quality way, complete the care for that patient prior to the time that, that is the author, authorized estimated date of discharge, you're able to turn the bed more quickly, right? And get the next patient in that is a pain patient uh, while well, the other one is, has opened up that capacity. So that's an estimate of about a $1,500 per patient bed turn opportunity. If again, your observed to expected ratio, which basically is what is the length of time the patient was there relative to what they were authorized for. So if that ratio is less than one, you can pick up those, those capacity turn uh, uh, revenue opportunities. The next number three is really all about reducing excess or avoidable days, right? So you wanna be able to, from the time the doctor writes the discharge order, get the patient out of bed in less than two hours and get that bed cleaned and available and essentially make sure that every patient is hitting that geometric mainly to stay target. 
Uh, number four, then, is the revenue opportunity of placing patients methodically uh, and logically in your own post-acute care uh, providers, which gives you a revenue opportunity, and at minimum, getting them into the best care environment that they that the patient needs and, and that they want and are, are part of that selection and approval process so that it's a seamless transition from the acute to the post-acute care setting. If all of that is done well and the patient is empowered and the, the care transitions are handling well, you're able to essentially address avoidable readmissions, which again is a big uh, cost impact if that's not done well. That continues, if you see the bottom of this diagram, that continues with your uh, patient uh, acquisition and retention, and as well as transitions into other kinds of care environments, whether it's hospital at home, telemedicine, uh, and so on. Angie, anything I missed there? No, Ben, I think um, you articulate the problem and why it matters um, really, really effectively. If we, if we click to the next slide, I wanna highlight a couple, um, a couple comments. Um, first, when you look at this diagram, which kind of bubbles up some of the details that that Ben just walked us through, if we look at this at a higher level, um, one of the things that we see is ho hospital systems have um, often operated more like a collection of real estate, like a portfolio of, of uh, sites and facilities um, for delivering you know, excellent patient care. In today's world, um, we need to um, ensure a couple things. One, we wanna make sure that the patient is um, in the optimal setting of care. And that optimal setting may be different from for every, every health system as they've defined how to utilize um, their various hospitals, uh, post-acute network, uh, freestanding EDs, et cetera. Um, uh, um, putting in place a, a process and a system for um, really what I would say redefining patient flow. Health systems have often looked at patient flow as everything that's happening inside the walls of the hospital. And what we do is we're gonna bubble that up a level and say it is not just about what's happening inside the walls of the hospital or inside the walls of the acute setting, but when we look at it and connect the pieces before the patient arrives and the pieces after the patient is leaving that acute setting, and we really connect that for access and orchestration all the way across the continuum of care for moving patients into the right setting and then moving them out to the next best setting. When we coordinate all of those logistics and centralize the decision-making process and standardize the workflow, what happens is you reduce variability, you drive consistency in your organization, you reduce the um, you know, disruptive impact of having staff all across the health system trying to do you know, the, the same function in different ways, and you really create a, an access center or a hub for, um, for controlling patient flow all the way through. So it starts with the patient transfers, and it, and it um, continues as the patient is getting prepared and ready to be um, discharged or leaving the acute care setting. Um, when you do this effectively and you can operate as one, one system of care, you maximize your throughput. There's an enormous um, revenue uh, um, impact to the health system, not only on the front end with patient acquisition, but also on starting to plug those gaps where you're leaking patients that have come into your health system, um, but you lose them as they attrit out or leave and, uh, and go to other, uh, other health systems or other organizations when they could have had the service um, provided inside of yours. So drives more revenue on the patient acquisition, plugs more leakage, drives more efficiency, reduces um, that variation in care and, and, and drives more consistency, which is operationally a much um, improved impact for your staff and your workers has been um, highlighted on some of the earlier slides. But I think, you know, if I look through the lens as the CEO of About, and I think about this as, uh, as an impact for executives in health systems, this is a cultural shift. 
So this impacts your organizations in a way that you start changing the culture operationally, you start redefining patient flow, you take a much more proactive approach in really orchestrating where patients should go for the care that they need. And you do that in a system-wide consistent process, which effectively becomes a service for the nurses, a service for the physicians, and just takes a bunch of uh, work off of their plate that keeps the physicians operating at top of license where the logistics work and these decisions can be handled in a more consistent and standardized manner. And, and so while today we're doing this for the acute care setting, this really applies and becomes a hub over time for all care setting decisions, whether you've got patients being managed at home with chronic conditions or you know, tracking their symptoms on their symptom checker and trying to figure out where to go. This becomes a central hub for the system to operate as a system of care. I would use a really simple metaphor and compare this you know, of course, with knowing what we do here in healthcare is, is um, so critical for people's lives. So I'm not trying to uh, reduce the importance of what we do, but this is very much like how Amazon would look at their business and say what they're really focused on is orders and deliveries and the things that happen inside the manufacturer manufacturing plant for you know producing the good is left up to the manufacturer but we're going to maximize the orders and the delivery it's a very similar process here where inside the walls of the hospital and enabling all the throughput and the processes that need to happen for that patient care those should really all be managed very effectively by your electronic medical record and the other systems that you've, you've got integrated there. Um, what we do is we extend those capabilities, optimize those investments, and handle the logistics and the flow all the way across the continuum of care. Next slide. Thanks, Angie. So just to connect the dots, back to what all of us on this call are quite familiar with, which of course is the Baldridge uh, framework. And what we're doing is just, is just visualizing that within an organizational hierarchy of needs is uh, putting it in context, right? So every organization has its strategy. And in this time of change, the strategy takes a beating and the idea is how do we focus on what really needs to happen to be able to be successful? Clearly the foundation are our people, our workforce. And so being able to give them what they need and ensure their continued engagement and, and uh, that they have uh, the resources necessary to be able to be successful is paramount. The next level above that, of course, is operations or organizational effectiveness, which you can't get unless you have good workforce uh, ownership and engagement. Um, over, overarching all of that, of course, is the measurement analysis and knowledge management. So determining how to secure and use your, your reliable data to make effective decisions. Uh, also, effective leadership, being able to to listen and support people on the front line and understand what's really going on and making those, those key adjustments necessary so that the organization can accomplish what it needs to. And ultimately driving customer value. Uh, now more than ever, voice the customer feedback is, is critical in these changing times, understanding how their needs can best be met when care environments are rapidly changing. And again, that all loops back to the strategy and ultimately the, the category seven results, uh, which are you know, broad-based uh, organizational. So that is our nexus and, and anchoring point uh, whenever we're engaging organizations is understanding that entire context and that what we can really do in particular is help with the organizational effectiveness and colleague engagement and the fulfillment of, of uh, organizational strategy. Next slide. Thanks, Ben. You know, I just want to wrap up with a couple comments here. And what we're talking about here um, in, in terms of how we make this happen, obviously, um, we have a lot of technology that we deploy and put to uh, put to into 
the environment. It's all this is all a SaaS based solution. So a lot of technology that we bring to bear that enables the workflow and the processes and the change management that we're talking about. Um, but but this is this is an organizational um, change and process improvement initiative. When we come in, uh, we come with the best practices with the people that have led these types of transformations operationally and clinically within health systems. They lead these initiatives uh, for our clients. We enable that change with the technology platform that about has purpose purpose um, built uh, to solve this this specific problem. Um, we, uh, we then connect that with a process that we have um, proven and tested over, over the past you know, 10 to 15 years that, uh, that, is, um, that is, again, purpose-built to address these problems. And so um, this has a, has a tremendous impact for health systems to operate more as a system of care, to drive that orchestration, to navigate patients to the appropriate setting of care to elevate outcomes, um, clinical, financial, operational, and culture, as we as we touched um, touched on earlier, and ultimately operate as one system of care. Next okay. slide. So I wanted to just uh, finish before we open it up for questions to give a, a kind of a practical visual representation of the collaboration we're now doing with the Baldridge foundation in thought leadership. So um, Dr. Roger Spoolman and Dr. Charles Peck, Chuck Peck, uh, are co-hosts for the Leader Dialogue Program. And uh, Dr. Darren Versillo, who is our chief medical officer, and I uh, collaborate with them on these. And essentially what we're, we're trying to do, uh, consistent with what Angie just talked about, is bring thoughtful, practical, supportive uh, topics to senior leaders and executives throughout the health systems to help them think through how to best navigate these difficult times of disruption and get to the highest level of performance. So for example, uh, many organizations are trying to deal with this balance, this load balance essentially between demand and supply. And so we help them by looking at that integration point and, and talk about and discuss are there access and orchestration best practices to consider? Uh, we, as I mentioned on Tuesday, talked about burnout. Um, there's another webinar coming up January 25th talking about, so what's next? And then in February, we're, we're going back to that second highest rated topic, which is uh, how do you function as a system uh, and get to being able to operate as, as one you know, integrated system of care? So we are, again, very grateful for the Baldridge community and the Baldridge Foundation in the collaboration on this. Yeah, I think the last slide here just um, give, gives you a sense of organizations that are working to address this problem um, with about today and uh, and you know clearly a pretty impressive list of health systems that have, have embarked on on this journey or portions of this journey to address access and orchestration more proactively uh, for their health systems. But um, uh, that's, re that's really all we wanted to communicate here on this slide. I think we're going to do some Q&A. Yes, we are. And before we do, I, I want to just uh, comment also, Angie, on that last slide where it says, join the movement to exceptional access and orchestration. Um, just for the audience's um, uh, awareness, five of those healthcare systems are Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award recipients. So uh, that that is, like you said, a very impressive list. Yeah. yeah. Thank we've you. Had, we, we've had a number of uh, questions come in. And uh, I'm just going to throw the first one out there and uh, see what you two uh, have to say about it. It is, given the current workforce challenges, can you further clarify how technology enabled processes can reduce stressors? Sure. Well, maybe I'll take a quick stab at that, Ben, and then you know add add um, add any comments that uh, or anything that I may have left out. Okay, sounds good. 
So when we look at these operational processes that we've been talking about today, whether it's on transferring patients and moving patients into the acute setting or on the transition out of the acute setting, what we often see when we go into health systems is each individual hospital or each care management team or the, you know, each individual facility has their own way of doing something. And they may have some, some processes that they've trained on or put in place across the organization, but it's left into, into, uh, into individual nursing stations and care management teams to, uh, to execute those portions of the business, which means a couple of things. One, very um, uh, inconsistent operational processes you're losing efficiencies by um, by not having having it uh, standardized. And when you when you when you have the work, the manual um, logistics work so distributed across the organization, you lose efficiency and effectiveness. And you have nurses and case managers and physicians doing work that prevents them from operating at top of license. So when you come in and you undertake an access and orchestration strategy or a, or a you know what I would say is you know, rethinking that patient flow to extend outside the walls of the hospital, when you undertake a strategy like this, what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to standardize the process. We're going to standardize the workflow. We're going to create a centralized hub to manage all of this activity with a team um, who, who's going to handle the workflow um, that, you know, and the processes that are coming in, and they're going to operate at top of license. So we've got nurses taking on nursing activity and physicians taking on appropriate activity that the physicians need to, and, you know, navigators or other administrative type staff handling the rest. And we can do that in this centralized hub or this access center, this command center, whatever, whatever terminology you want to use. And what that effectively does is it takes a bunch of unnecessary manual, not top of license work that's being distributed through the organization, and it centralizes and streamlines it, and it allows the work that the um, that that had been, you know, being done by those nurses and case managers and physicians, it allows them to spend more of their time on direct patient care and not managing the logistics. So the uh, it it takes stress and friction and and uh, and workload off of the clinicians on the floor and centralizes that into one hub. Ben, what would you add to that? You're a process yeah. improvement guy. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah it, the there's normally and everybody under, understands that there's about forty percent waste in processes just in general, um, and we staff accordingly so that there's redundancies to compensate for that. But in today's COVID environment, there isn't redundant staff. You barely have enough staff just to cover the basics. So that 40% waste becomes really a magnified stressor. And it, it makes the kind of technology you're talking about, Angie, even that much more critical uh, because you don't have organizational resilience, right? You don't have redundancy. So the idea is wherever you can map technology and particularly composable solutions that augment your existing IT infrastructure like your EMRs and so forth that offload some of these, these non-value added tasks but things that have to be done that are in processes, the better for your teams. That's exactly, exactly right. Thanks, Ben. Well, here's our next question. What do you anticipate to be the evolution of care settings post pandemic? Sure. Well, uh, you know what we what we've seen throughout the pandemic, and what we've just seen in healthcare over the last um, couple of years, or uh, you know, probably ten years or so, is a significant distribution in terms of the care settings that where patients can access care. Through the pandemic, we saw an accelerant in telemedicine, for example. We've seen the emergence of freestanding EDs. We've got um, the home as a new setting of care for patients, even in a very acute state. So what does that mean? It means it is becoming far more complex with more options and more settings of care um, for an individual patient or for a, a patient's 
caregiver um, to to uh, to move that patient to or to recommend that that patient uh, um, access. So what does that mean? As the complexity continues to increase, um, are we as a healthcare or you know providers and and health systems? where are we going to place that burden of decision-making and where should that burden be placed? Who's in the best position to help facilitate um, and help those patients and their family members make the appropriate decisions? And so as complexity rises and as health systems focus on, you know, on their service and their patient experience and the patient journey, um, we're helping provide the controls to provide the consistency and and connect settings that are um, becoming more distributed and more diverse and more options and more complex, we're helping to pull that together and make it easier to uh, to to help families, caregivers, and patients get the care that they need. Um, so so I think you know to answer it maybe a little bit more succinctly, we we believe it's going to become more complex. And this is going to be a necessary infrastructure for all health systems to have in place um, to support their um, population health strategies and their operations in general. And the only thing I would add to that, Al, is we've seen and been able to help the state of Arizona, for example, in their statewide management of the patient access challenges that are inherent in a pandemic. And given the fact that this pandemic just continues with, you know, new waves of variants, that seems to, to be even more important. And Stephanie, I know you're going to go next uh, or soon, but on the community of excellence side, being able to provide that kind of much needed infrastructure for these different jurisdictions to, to help them manage these uh, increasing diverse needs of a population across a geography uh, is essential. And it comes down to these kinds of logistical processes and tools that Angie is talking about. Yeah, and you know, I, I just wanna make one other comment on this um, because we also operate in a very complex environment from a financial and a reimbursement standpoint. So as, as more value-based care capitation type models come into play in our various healthcare um, systems, the control um, equation becomes more and more paramount. Um, to be able to have the infrastructure, the technology, the services, the network in place to help control where those um, referrals go and where the patient goes um, becomes really important in not only providing care, but also managing those types of financial arrangements. Um, patient choice is a factor, and there's a question in the um, in the chat about you know the patient choice on the optimal setting, and the patient choice is absolutely a factor and required as you're moving patients out of the acute setting. Um, oftentimes, what we see is health systems will give you know just the big here's the direct really here's all the post acute settings you can choose from. Where would you like to go? And the patients are actually looking for some help. And how do I make the best decision? Where would you recommend that I go? And, and we can enable that um, those decisions and help patients make better choices, leveraging data, leveraging uh, um, our own, uh, the network that the health system has with preferred providers and you know, quality ratings, et cetera, um, as well as support the financial um, needs that that patient might have in terms of ensuring that they stay in network and, and see providers where they are um, you know, financially authorized to be treated. So all of that becomes um, much uh, more easy to facilitate when you put technology and tools together to enable um, this type of uh, decision-making. Whether you're fee-for-service, value-based care, um, it, it supports, uh, supports both models. And as I said earlier, um, we believe is a necessary infrastructure in a much more complex world moving forward. That question and those answers are just a great segue into our um, last question here that we have time for, which is to learn more, what are some of the upcoming leader dialogue topics that we see being addressed? Oh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks for that question. So you saw at the beginning of our discussion, a survey that we had done 
with healthcare leaders to understand what's top of mind for them from a challenges standpoint. And today we touch briefly on workforce issues um, with you know too few nurses and aides and techs. And then and then the second one was operating as one, the idea of systemness. But there were quite a few others: uh, expense line, far exceeding revenue line, an unclear digital front door and strategy as to you know top transformational priorities and opportunities. Um, how to capitalize on existing market opportunities, how to address disruption by uh, uh, non-healthcare players that are coming into the space and so forth. So what we're continuing to do is uh, our own version of voice to the customer, listen, uh, understand where leaders are at, and then create timely uh, uh, topics around that. Um, we have podcasts that occur on the first and third Tuesdays of every month at uh, noon central. And then uh, we have webinars. We're in the middle of a three-part webinar series that I mentioned started with burnout. Uh, it was That was on Tuesday. And then on January 25th, uh, there is a webinar on what's next, which will encompass a number of these topics. And then uh, one in February on the 22nd, uh, addressing systemness. Um, we also have executive roundtables, both virtual and in-person. The first in-person one will be in Atlanta, um, uh, April 7th and 8th for CEOs. This will be a small group of about 15. And what we're going to uh, focus on is how do you move from the disruption and change that we're experiencing now, where it's so disruptive that even change has changed, to getting back to optimal performance? How do you take advantage of the disruption, actually, to to do some things and look at some innovations that you may heretofore have not really looked at. So uh, hopefully, Al, that gives the, the group here a sense of the kinds of topics we're going to be addressing. Thanks, Ben and Angie. That was really an exciting presentation and um, um, very worthwhile. Uh, just as a reminder to the audience, um, it's going. this is recorded and will be available on the Institute's website in about 72 hours after the presentation early next week. Um, if you want to learn more about leader dialogue and our joint collaboration between the foundation, the Institute for Performance Excellence, and about healthcare, you can go to the Institute's website as well. And lastly, thank you, Angie and Ben, for being Mac Baldrige Society members and supporting the foundation. Thank you. Our next presenter is Bob Fangmeyer, the director of the Baldrige Performance Excellence Program. Bob, I'll turn Bob. it over to you. All right, thank you, Al. I always appreciate this opportunity. I like to uh, be able to keep folks informed about what's happening with the Baldage program. Uh, we have limited time, of course, so I've just got one slide, uh, and I'd just like to touch on a few items uh, of interest. First, uh, those of you who have been around a while have probably heard me talk about the award process redesign effort. After starting a slow rollout with pilots in both 2018 and 2019, followed by a deployment out through several alliance programs for further testing in 2019, we had the intention of going live in 2020. Unfortunately, we've all been talking about the impacts of COVID and we had to delay uh, implementation due to those impacts as well. Instead of deploying the redesign, we had to redesign everything we were doing. Uh, despite the ongoing challenges presented by COVID, we are moving forward with the redesign in 2022. We've already started developing training materials, um, resource materials, additional resources, and programming a new online examiner evaluation tool for the new process itself. The redesign is focused on simplifying existing steps in the process, eliminating low value added steps and simplifying and improving the feedback that's provided to applicant organizations. With the redesign, we will be able to better utilize examiner resources and enhance value add to examiners and to applicants. We'll be able to provide more accurate, easier to produce and easier to read feedback reports and will improve the timeliness, clarity, transparency and overall quality of those feedback reports that applicants receive following the process. Very briefly, just a couple of highlights of those changes. Uh, first, no scoring or comment writing during the independent review phase. There will be dialogue with the applicant organization before the team starts its consensus review, 
and there will be earlier information sharing with the organization during site visit planning and preparation. Feedback itself will be in the form of simple statements of key findings with each key finding supported um, by bulleted evidence statements. And in addition to the comments and scores, the applicant will receive the scoring rationale for every single item. So we really do think this is going to be easier to produce and much more valuable. Feedback from the pilots and from the Alliance programs that have used the new approach has been very, very positive. Um, and we are excited about the changes to come and look forward to improving the award process experience for all those involved. So speaking of examiners, we are currently recruiting volunteers to serve as examiners during the 2022 award process. As noted, uh, they will have the opportunity to utilize the revised award process and they'll benefit from the simplified approach to the evaluation and the simplified approach to feedback commentary. As an added plus for many, serving as an examiner in 2022 will not require one to travel to Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, it will be 100% virtual. Uh, our online training has been improved each of the last two years. Uh, it was very well received last year, and I promise you will be even better in 2022. If you or someone you know might be interested in a tremendous learning experience and an opportunity to help an organization improve their performance, to the benefit of their customers, their workforce, their other stakeholders, please encourage them to visit our website and apply to be an examiner. Another advantage of having online examiner training is that for some examiners, it will allow them to attend the first in-person Quest for Excellence conference uh, in the past three years. That'll be held April three to six. We know many in the Baldwin community are really looking forward to being able to get together, to reconnect, to establish new connections, and to learn from the many award recipients that'll be presenting at the conference. It's been a long time since we've had the opportunity to gather together, and I really do think this could be something special. So I hope you all can make it. Registration for Quest is now open. Please visit our website and plan your trip today. I also wanna update you on our collaboration with the Department of Commerce. Uh, we have been working with Commerce, with the Department of Labor, with numerous think tanks, advocacy groups, academics and business leaders around the effort to develop a job quality framework. It's the intent of the framework to first, help managers and leaders understand the importance and the value of improving the quality of the jobs they offer, establish a widely accepted definition of a high quality job, which is something that does not exist currently, and perhaps most importantly, provide practical, adaptable, non-prescriptive guidance around how organizations can improve the quality of the jobs that they offer. We believe it's very important that this framework be appealing and user-friendly for your average manager or leader, while still being an effective tool for helping to make bad jobs good and good jobs great. We're making great progress and we expect to release the framework by the end of January. Now, finally, um, I'm sure some of you are aware that there has been a delay in the notification of the 2021 Baldrige Award recipients. There's not a whole lot I can share at this point, uh, but I can say that the department and NIST continue to work together to evaluate the judges panel recommendations and identify the winners of the Baldrige Award for 2021. Of course, we are all excited and looking forward to notifying the winners as soon as possible. And we will do so as soon as that process is complete. I've fielded lots of questions, uh, many of which that we cannot answer at this time, but I do want to put some rumors to rest. This is in no way uh, reflective of the program standing within commerce. We're not losing our funding. The new administration is thus far the most interested in leveraging Baldridge in at least the past 15 years. And the program is not going away. There's a lot of good things happening and the future looks bright. We just need to get over this, this particular hump. So I'll stop there. Um, and I know Al will wait till the end to see if there's questions and I will um, turn it over to whoever's next. Thanks, Bob, we appreciate that update. Brian Lasseter could not be with us today. So I'm going to take his place and give you a few updates. Uh, first of all, as you should all know, if you're going to get started on a Ball Ridge journey, the first place to connect 
is with your state-based program. And you can do that on the Alliance for Performance Excellence website. The Alliance is also responsible for the Baldridge Fall Conference each year, and last October's conference was wildly successful. Next year's in 2022 will be hosted in San Diego by the California State-Based Program in collaboration with Communities of Excellence 2026. And to learn more, you can dial into baldridgealliance.org, which is a great segue to our next presenter, Stephanie Norling, the Executive Director of Communities of Excellence 2026. Stephanie? Well, hello everyone, and thank you for this great opportunity to share some of our progress today. Um, I'm very happy to say that we currently have 24 communities that are involved in Communities of Excellence adopting the framework and participating in our National Learning Collaborative or as alumni of our National Learning Collaborative. Um, their session started this past October and began with a kickoff conference where we shared um, one of the highlights, I think, of the session is where we had nine different communities share their promising practices and results um, of their Communities of Excellence journey. So it was a great experience. I'm also very happy to say that this year we had 15 communities that were recognized on their journeys to community performance excellence through our assessment and recognition program including six at what is currently the top level of recognition, the Communities of Excellence recognition. So I hope you'll join me in congratulating these communities over the next year. Now we have a number of exciting programs and new courses being offered this year. So in addition to our learning collaborative program, we have a spring course called Preparing for Your Community Excellence Journey that we offer. It's a six-week program that's offered for those of you interested or wondering if your community and if your organization is ready to take on a community excellence journey. We're also preparing a uh, shorter, I think, uh, two-day course, um, similarly on critical success factors for communities, as well as a course we're preparing in the future on identifying and tracking results in community performance. So hope you'll stay tuned on those. And all of this is part of what's a new effort of ours to um, bring in more tools and more resources to communities and organizations um, and community performance excellence, um, beginning of what you can see on the bottom left here, which is our journey roadmap. And the roadmap is helping us lead towards um, other new tools, such as a self-assessment, a community scorecard, uh, data literacy and communication tools, more promising practices, an inventory of those practices, and additional leadership trainings. So we're really excited with all of the new offerings that we have going on this year that I think will really help us expand on the work that we're doing and, and how we support communities. Finally, um, December, we're in this December, we're holding our annual fundraising campaign. So if you'd like to help us um, continue to provide these services and expand those, please consider visiting our website at communitiesofexcellence2026.org and then going to how to help. So thank you very much. Thanks for that update, Stephanie. As a reminder, the Institute has a number of certification courses that are fully online, self-paced, including Lean Six Sigma, Project Management, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and much more. To learn more about these courses and our upcoming online course, Mastering Strategy in Healthcare Certification Program, which will be offered in partnership with the George Washington University Center for Public Leadership. Visit the Institute website at baldridgeinstitute.org. Thanks to everyone for attending today and especially our guest presenters about healthcare. As a reminder, the recorded version of today's presentation and slides will be available on the Institute website early next week. And once again, thanks to all of our sponsors, especially those members of the Mac Baldridge Society who are trustees for the Institute for Performance Excellence. It is their generous support that makes presentations like today's possible. Thanks again, everyone. Please be safe and have a great holiday season.